Now, I know you've been out and about and you've seen all these new build communities that are just popping up everywhere and perhaps maybe you've even stopped in at a couple of sales offices and checked out the model homes. Maybe you've even fallen in love with a couple of them. You know, I also like visiting the model homes and seeing what's going on. And that's why in today's video, I'm gonna share with you five tips that will help you be smart when making that new home construction purchase. Hi and welcome back. My name is John Farron. I'm a realtor with HomeSmart Lifestyles right here in Queen Creek, Arizona. And if you follow this channel at all, you know that I love talking about new build communities and taking you on tours of the various model homes. And that's why today I'm gonna to share with you five tips that will help make that new build construction purchase a successful one. Now this first tip might come across as self-serving, but trust me, it, it really isn't. Tip number one is to make sure that you use a realtor. I think most people understand the need to have an agent representing them when they purchase a resale home, but when it comes to buying a new build construction home, I think a lot of times the thought just really never even enters their mind. Well, it's true, realtors can and do help buyers in the purchase of new construction homes. So let's say you're out and about and you have a few minutes to kill, so you decide to pop into a new community and check out the model homes. Now one of the first things a new home sales rep is going to ask you to do is to register and sign in. Now I know that sounds fairly innocent and most people sign in without even giving it a second thought. I think a lot of people believe that that sales rep will represent them during the purchase of their home, but in reality that sales rep is an employee of the builder and they represent the builder's interests. Now the problem comes up when if you are working with a realtor or you think you want to use one when it does come time to purchase a home, if you visit the model home without your agent with you on the first time, there's a really good chance that that agent will not be allowed to assist you in the purchase process if you decide to go ahead and buy in that particular community. When the sales reps have you sign in like that, they pretty much have excluded the agent from being able to assist you and you now have become their own personal customer. And when you signed in, I'm sure you didn't realize that any of that was actually occurring. So I always give my buyers a stack of business cards and I tell them if they're out and about and they feel the need to pop into a new build community and I'm not there, to at least tell the sales rep that they're working with an agent already and give that representative my business card. Now, if you don't have a card, Make sure you put your agent's name down on the registration form when they ask you to register and always tell them that you are currently working with an agent. Then the very next thing you want to do is call your agent, let them know what you've just did. That way the agent can call the sales rep and follow up with them. Now tip number two is know all of the cost involved. What I mean by that is know how much this home is really going to cost you. So one of the things that may have lured you into that community is the great big sign out front that says, you know, new homes from the low 400,000s or whatever that price point may be. Well, that price that's listed on that big sign or on the price sheet or even on the website, that price is the lowest price for the smallest home with absolutely no upgrades at all. So that is the bare bones basic price. But I don't know about you, but I don't know anybody who purchases that bare bones plain Jane home. They always add upgrades. For example, this is the smallest home offered in a particular community here in the area, and it has a base price of $409,000. Now, most floor plans are flexible and they have options where you can add a room or make a den or, or do some type of a bump out. And these are called structural options. And you'll need to decide on the configuration of your home at the time that you sign your contract. And of course, each structural option does have a cost associated with it. And then there are lot premiums that need to be considered as well. These are added pricing that are attached to the lots that are larger or more desirable or closer to amenities than the standard lot. Lot premiums can range anywhere from zero to more than $100,000 depending on the community. But for now and purposes of this conversation, let's just say that you pick a lot for this home that has a $9,000 premium. So you know the base price of the home, you've done your structural upgrades, so you know the additional price of those, and you know the lot premium. So you add all of that together and you come up with a subtotal. It's not quite the full purchase price of the home just yet. 
And that's because you won't know the full purchase price until after you've done your design center visit. At the design center, you'll pick out all of your interior upgrades. The two things that most buyers upgrade right off the bat are the flooring and the kitchen. Now, there's a whole lot of other upgrades that you can select as well, but a lot of those you can actually do later after you close on your home. Now, here's a quick story. I always kind of thought that maybe the builders were overcharging for flooring. So when my wife and I built a home a few years ago, we decided to put in the contractor grade basic flooring. And then before we moved in, we were going to remove all of that flooring and have a flooring contractor come in and put in what we wanted. Well, you know what they say about the best laid plans, right? So it took three years of living in that home before we got around to removing the flooring and putting in what we really wanted. Now, that was a 10 day process where our lives were completely um, uprooted and jostled and messed up. And at the end of all of that, I don't think we saved a dime. In fact, it probably cost us more. So these days, I'm kind of now of the opinion that if you're gonna upgrade the flooring, do it through the builder so that it's done and it's finished by the time you move in. Plus it comes with the builder's warranty. Now during that design center visit, it's kind of easy to get carried away and maybe go a little overboard. So make sure you are aware of that and kind of keep an eye out for that happening. Most buyers are spending about 15 to 17% of the base price of the home on their interior upgrades. So here's a pro tip, make sure you factor that into your budget as well. So now you can take that subtotal that you had, add to it the amount you spent at the design center and now you have the full purchase price of your home. And that brings us to tip number three, which are the closing costs. Now, in addition to whatever down payment you might be making, you can also count on having about $5,000 or so additional expenses in the form of closing costs. Now, when you purchase a resale home, the buyer has their own specific closing costs and the seller has their own specific closing costs and generally both parties pay their own costs. But not so with new builds. When you purchase a new build construction home, the builder pushes almost all of their closing costs with the exception of some real estate fees and a couple other minor expenses. All those costs are pushed off onto the buyer. So not only do you get to pay your own closing costs, but you get to pay the builder's closing costs as well. Now, before you click out of this video and start cussing out the builders, most builders do offer cash incentives that can be used towards your closing costs and those are typically based upon you using their preferred lender. And in most cases, these incentives actually cover most, if not all, of your closing costs. But then you're left wondering, is it smart to use their preferred lender? Well, again, in most cases, I advise my buyers to go ahead and use their lender so that they can take advantage of these incentives. Now, tip number four has to do with the inspections. So there are certain milestones built into the process along the way where the builder conducts certain inspections. And you add to that the fact that the city also has their own inspection schedule where a building inspector comes out to inspect the work of the builder. And in some cases, no further work can be done until the city inspects what's been done thus far. But the first thing that you should recognize is that building a home is an imperfect process and that there will be mistakes made along the way. It's important to understand that there's no such thing as a perfect home. The truth is, regardless of the price point, things happen because the home builder is working with natural products and because we're all humans and that makes us imperfect beings. So then the question is, should you have your own home inspector come and do some inspections during the build process? My answer to that is, it depends. How has your experience been this far? If the builder's been doing everything right and you haven't really had any issues, uh, maybe you might want to hold off on having an inspection. But if there have been problems all along the way and mistakes made and poor workmanship, then perhaps having your own personal home inspector come out and do an inspection might be the best course of action for you. So at what point should you do that? Well, there's two stages that I recommend doing the inspections at. The first is just before the pre-drywall walkthrough. And this is where everything on the inside of your house that's behind the walls is still visible. And then the second point at which you might want to consider an inspection is just prior to your final walkthrough. That way anything that the inspector finds can be added to the final punch list 
and then in the week prior to you actually closing on your home and moving in, the builder has an opportunity to correct whatever's on that list. And then tip number five kind of goes along with that, and that's being flexible and having a reasonable build time expectation. Currently, builders are quoting about 12 to 14 months build time from the time you sign your contract to the time you're moving into your home. And generally, things tend to go along pretty smoothly, but you never know what tomorrow brings, and so you need to be prepared for some delays. Especially now, while we're still experiencing material and labor shortages, and buried deep inside that contract, which you're probably not even aware of, is a little clause that actually gives your builder two years to complete your home without any penalties. Now, I know it may not feel like it at times, but the builder really does not want to have delays in this build process and they're not dragging their feet trying to drag the process out. In fact, the builder has probably about as much incentive to finish the home on time as you have in wanting that home done so that you can move in. And that's because every day that that home's not finished is the day they're not getting paid. They don't get paid, they don't make money until that home closes. So really everybody's goal is to have this house finished on time but some things are just out of everyone's control. So you need to be prepared for that, especially if you're trying to coordinate the sale of your current home so that it closes in conjunction with the closing of your new home so you have a smooth transition, or if you're in a lease and you're trying to coordinate the end of that lease with the uh, closing of your new home. Now in those situations, you probably should have a backup plan in place. If you're renting, perhaps you can talk to your landlord and go on a month to month basis once your lease is up. And if you're selling your home, uh, perhaps you can extend the closing date out or in another scenario, maybe you could uh, arrange with your buyer to actually lease the home back for a period of time until your new home is finished and you can make that move. And if neither of those options are really viable, then you may want to consider arranging for some short-term rental housing to cover that gap. And so again, just have a backup plan in place. Now, if you are considering building a new home in the Queen Creek area or really anywhere in the Phoenix metropolitan area, and you think that you and I might make a good fit, well, then I invite you to call, text, email me, singing telegram will even work, However it is that you choose to communicate because when it comes to buying and selling homes in the Southeast Valley, I've got your back. Now, I hope you found this information useful. There's a lot more that can be said on this topic. And in fact, I probably have said most of it in other videos. So feel free to surf around the channel, check out some of the other videos. You might find some of those pretty interesting too. While you're there, do me a favor, hit that subscribe button Click on the bell so you'll be notified each time a new video gets uploaded. And while you're at it, you may as well follow me on social media right here. Now, while you're busy doing all of that, I'm going to be right here looking forward to seeing you in the next video.